Hello and welcome to the third and final day of Halo Fest here at PAX Prime 2011. First off, uh, we're going to kick things off in a second, but I wanted to thank everyone for attending uh, this year and making the 10th anniversary celebration uh, truly special to each and every one of us at 343. Uh, I'd also like to thank IGN for being our media uh, partner this weekend, streaming the panels, posting them pretty much immediately afterwards on their site. <clears throat> and uh, to those who uh, can att couldn't attend in person, uh, we want to welcome you joining us uh, at home, online. So uh, my name is David Ellis, I'm content producer at 343 Industries, and uh, immediately to my left... <laughs> and immediately to my left, a gentleman you may or may not know, Mr. Frank O'Connor, Franchise Development Director at 343. <laughs> And moving on down the line is uh, Kenneth Scott, art director on Halo 4. <laughs> Kiki Wolfkill, executive producer on Halo 4. <laughs> Josh Holmes, creative director on Halo 4. <laughs> and Sotaro Tajima, uh, we call him Tajin, he's our audio director on Halo 4. And to kind of get things started, we're going to show a video piece that sort of uh, sets the tone for us as a studio, and uh, hopefully we'll let you get to know a little bit about us before we kick things off. Uh, so we're just going to roll video one real quick. One of the most exciting parts of Halo 4 is really this team that we brought together. It's a team that brings a lot of talent and a lot of past accomplishments, and I think we all came together and we were so excited about the things that we set out to do. It's been a challenge to not be able to talk about it. This thing that we've been hiding and keeping under our covers is finally let loose. This is a really important E3 for us, both as a studio and, and also as the first announcement of, of Halo 4. I mean, we've been building the, the background and the, the fabric for this story for years. What does it feel like for him to come back, for Master Chief to come back, and for us to really enter this new generation of his journey? There's a lot of people out there that you know, may not have seen the legendary ending of Halo 3, may not know that there is still a story to be told. Every novel that you've read in the last couple of years, every comic book, the terminals in Halo Anniversary Edition, Everything is feeding directly into the, the story for the next Halo trilogy. It's, it's daunting. You know, you've got this, this franchise that means so much to so many people. Um, it's got 10 years of history behind it, uh, incredible stories, incredible experiences, and we have to live up to all of that. The importance of the trilogy isn't, oh, we have this whole plan that involves we want three of these things. It's we have an incredibly rich story to tell. Right, and what it means for, for the Chief to evolve, um, it's just gonna take that long. Nothing is being done sort of haphazardly. We're always keeping that eye on the horizon of where we want this story to go. Gathered a, a huge pool of talent of every stripe and all of those people are just channeling this incredible amount of passion and energy and talent into a thing that they already loved. The pressure that this team puts on itself to be great and to, to try and achieve excellence is that's, that's the primary engine. So uh, hopefully that video uh, is kind of an introduction uh, for some of us at the, on the panel today, but I want to start things off by uh, asking Frank, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the history of 343, uh, why it's, it was created, and uh, what it's been like to keep quiet all this time. Uh, yeah, so 343 uh, started uh, technically about three years ago. Uh, Bonnie Ross, our general manager, was tasked with, uh, we're already publishing uh, ODST and Reach with Bungie, and uh, we knew that it was going to be a transition, and we knew that we needed a studio to continue the Halo franchise, and Bonnie Ross was tasked with setting up that studio. And uh, most of the people sitting at this table were there at the start of that, and, and were the core group around which the studio formed. And uh, so 
some of you are out in the audience, but there's a lot of people back at the studio, uh, 200 or so people working on Halo 4, and uh, have been for a couple of years now. And, and as it was mentioned in the video, it's been hard to hide that light under a bushel because everyone's so passionate and excited about the project. But uh, today is really, uh, in some ways, the debut of the studio and the 200 creative engineering, uh, art, audio, marketing, I mean, just a, a huge uh, force of people working on Halo 4. Next question is for Josh. I mean, some people were caught a little bit surprised when we announced that uh, Halo 4 was the first part of a new trilogy. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why we decided to go ahead and announce three games instead of one. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it, it was important for us um, to kind of signal to the fans and the community what our intentions were and our, our, our commitment um, to this story that we want to tell. Um, and, you know, when we first started working on uh, laying the plans for the Reclaimer trilogy uh, a little over two years ago, um, you know, we kind of knew exactly the story that we wanted to tell. Um, and uh, and it's, it's really important for us because a lot of what this trilogy is going to focus on is, is exploring the character of Master Chief and, you know, what it means to bring him back and, and, uh, and really getting uh, a little bit closer to that character than we've ever experienced before in, in any of the past games. I, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of depth to John um, that exists in, primarily in, in a lot of the other fiction that we really felt we wanted to explore more deeply and, and lay a, a journey for him that would transform and evolve him uh, as a character and a man. Kiki, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, kind of building the team there at 343. From the ground up, uh, what are kind of the people we were looking for? And uh, let's talk a little bit about the culture of the studio there. Yeah, I mean, really there, were, there was two goals. One was to build a team, obviously, to create Halo 4. And the other was to really lay the foundation for the studio and really define its, its culture. So, you know, I would say at a, a foundational level, there was the... Um, really finding the level of technical and creative expertise, um, really just to execute on, on the legacy of a Halo game. Um, but then there was also sort of the, the maturity and, and frankly the guts to take on this kind of challenge, which was take on this amazing legacy um, and define the next 10 years. And so I think from a team perspective, those pieces were, were really important. Um, and then from a studio and culture perspective, it was how do we find that sort of deep talent who also has a collaborative spirit um, and I would say a, a craftsman approach um, so that we could really look at um, building a trilogy and building a studio for the long term. And, and of course passion, right? Pure passion, uh, not just for what Halo has been but also for what it could be and, and how we define that, I think. Both Kenneth and, and Tajin um, certainly embody this. Um, you know, they are both industry best, but they also are going to bring their own unique creative perspective. And so that's going to, that's sort of going to breathe a different life into um, really what all of you will experience in uh, John's next story. Uh, Frank, we talked a little bit about uh, 343 as a game studio, but uh, we're also much more than that. We're responsible for all things in the Halo universe, whether it's um, books, toys, videos. I mean, uh, you know, it Halo 4 is the, obviously the game we're here to talk about, and, uh, and it is, as you say, a really big franchise, but everything that we make in that franchise, whether it's comic book, whether it's a novel, whether even action figures, uh, they, they all feed directly into the games. I mean, you guys have probably seen the, the covers for Greg Bear's Cryptum and Primordium. So Greg worked with uh, our artists, and uh, Sparth in particular, uh, to create concepts that come and this is about not giving too much away, but those, those cover images come directly from Halo 4 concept work, and they are germane and specific to the work that Greg is doing. And that's an example of how every single story that we're telling from Cryptum to Glasslands and beyond uh, is, is feeding the game. Uh, everything pours into the game eventually, and, uh, and people love the, the extended franchise, and we just want to make it a richer, uh, and more meaningful experience for them when they, when they do encounter those little notes. Uh, the visual style of Halo has been very important. There's a uh, visual vocabulary that's become familiar to the millions of Halo fans around the world. Uh, Kenneth, when you were tasked with taking up 
this undertaking to uh, you know bring Halo to life once again, Master Chief. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you wanted to approach uh, creating the look of this new trilogy. There was a lot of inputs initially. Uh, like I think the the thing that really brought most of us together as a group was a love for uh, for the deep fiction that the universe has and trying to find ways that we can, um, in a very genuine fashion, bubble that up through the artwork. Uh, the art. Uh, differentiates itself, I think, from other games in that we're trying to carry the emotional tone of uh, the player's experience throughout the game. And that's been actually very exciting. And I think uh, another larger input was just the understanding that uh, you know, the, the fan base and the people who have invested in this universe um, have, uh, have been in this universe for 10 years now. They've grown up, and uh, the, the, the art and the, the experience that they're having needs to mature, too. So the familiarity sometimes breeds, uh, people are protective about the little bit. So I've got to ask the question everyone has been asking since E3. What's up with the Chief's armor? Give me the scoop. <laughs> um, well, actually, a lot of it we can, uh, like, um, when we initially started Chief, and I will, I will, I'm loopy on decongestants right now, so I will make a confession to this team right now. Uh, the Chief you saw in the teaser is not the final Chief. Uh, we understand how important uh, Chief is to the to this, uh, this universe and the people who play them, and we've, uh, we've, we're probably on iteration number four right now. There's a lot of love and investment in making sure that he's, uh, he's the best that he can possibly be. I think the focus for him specifically was really wanting the player to feel like him, uh, sell that fantasy of, I'm a bioengineered superhero wearing 800 pounds of tank and jet fighter. And so a lot of those, and uh, hopefully once we cross the finish line and you guys are playing it, that, uh, that, will, that will read to you. Since we haven't revealed what exactly Master Chief and Cortana are headed towards at the end of the E3 trailer, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of places we'll be visiting in this game, Kenneth. I'm sorry, could you ask the question one more time? Yeah, David? yeah, so no problem. I was looking at Frank. Ah, he's <laughs> glorious. <laughs> so since we haven't revealed exactly where Cortana and the Master Chief uh, are, were headed towards at the end of the E3 trailer, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of places we'll be visiting in this game. Okay, I, th I, think, um, I think there's a wonderful palette that we have because as you guys have seen from, uh, from the legendary uh, ending to, uh, to Halo 3 is uh, we are, we're, uh, Chief is arcing towards a very mysterious foreigner planet. So clearly we're going to deal with a, a universe that has a lot of... Um, I promise I would fumble to make everybody else look good on this panel, so that's for them. Uh, <laughs> You're going to have to ask the question again, David. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, <laughs> this beautiful imagery you're it's looking at right that. here is probably throwing you off. Uh, just basically talk a little bit about the, the different places we're going to be visiting in this game. Well, we're, we're investing heavily in the look and feel of, uh, of, of Forerunner. Um, I, I think the thing that really connected people uh, initially way back in the first Halo experience is that on mystery. So that's where a lot of our pressure on the art team is kind of going right now. It's like we really want the player to feel that... Uh, that initial experience of discovery. And you've lived with the Forerunner for 10 years now, th three, four games. Um, what do we do to kind of move it forward so it still connects the player with a mystery, but it hasn't, it hasn't fallen into the abstraction that will happen uh, over that period of time? So there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of push there. And there's, I, you know, the, the, the other interesting thing, and you can see it in some of the concept art, you've lived with inert, static, Forerunner, abandoned structures. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, a different aspect of Forerunner engineering and Forerunner architecture when it's not completely inert and dead and empty. The visuals are just one part of the world that uh, brings the game experience to life. Uh, one of the others, but uh, very important as well, is audio, whether it's sound or music. Um, the Halo trilogy, the original Halo trilogy, all the Halo games. Um, music, sound, audio have been hugely important. Um, been very fortunate to, you know, obviously have the amazing music that Marty O'Donnell's been composing over the last 10 years. I'm wondering, uh, Tajin, if you could talk a little bit about uh, how do you plan on helping put the player uh, in the story using these mediums? Yeah, I know it is hard. So because, of, you know, the Halo has shown us incredible audio fantasy for 10 years. So Halo has fascinated me for a long time. But that's why I wanted to work for Halo Universe. I'm so excited about this challenge. So my main goal 
uh, on Hellfall is to achieve music and audio design well synced with a deep hell of story. So, uh, therefore, I started audio production with writing down an emotional curve, considering a whole story. And whenever composing a music or designing sound for a particular section, so we are thinking about where Master Chief's emotion is, where player's emotion is in the story. So, uh, making, making it fit to the emotional cup. So with a strong connection of story and audio, I want to move people who love Halo, make you exciting, feel tension, and cry. Yeah, I think one of the things... I think one of the things that was uh, most exciting for me in terms of being able to get both Kenneth and Tajin is they're both amazing artists in their craft, but they're also both extraordinary storytellers. And that was something that was really important for us from both an audio and an art standpoint to make sure with every piece um, that we're showing uh, or every piece of sound that it's telling all of you a story about the world and the characters and, and Halo. So every now and again, I'll go by Tajin's office, and I'm always surprised by the things I hear. Sometimes a little disturbed. <laughs> You're going to be creating a lot of sounds you know, for things that don't exist and, in fact, haven't even been imagined before. I'm wondering, how do you create something that both sounds otherworldly yet is grounded in reality? Yeah, so audio team is focusing on so making something unique all the time. We want to achieve a uh, kind of believable sci-fi audio experience um, to the Halo universe. We want to bring exciting, realistic audio to the Halo universe. So, um, calm down, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in the galaxy of the future, I imagine Master Chief's experience should sound a little bit different from the sound we were familiar with. So we needed a new sound. So actually, we had planned to try to record something in outer space using a special microphone. But uh, it was hard to get money for that. <laughs> 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 so, but seriously though, these are things we are always thinking about. So to find strange and wonderful sounds, we have had a number of field recording sessions in unique locations, such as Tasmania. And we often find interesting sounds where it is normally intolerated for humans such as recording and water, or in fire and ice, which we did by using uh, unique microphones. And sometimes, my team worked in extremely dangerous conditions to get a great, awesome sonic wave for Halo 4. Watch this video. Roll video too. <laughs>
So far today, we talked a little bit about the look and sound for Halo 4, and all these things are incredibly important for transporting people throughout the universe. Uh, but I know millions of fans are at home, and those in the audience are wondering one thing. How's it going to play? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it plays like Halo. Um, that, 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 was, uh, that was really, I mean, it, it sounds simple, but that was really important to us. Um, you know, as a team, we're brought together by this love for this universe and this play experience, um, and we wanted to really maintain uh, the core of that magical Halo feel. But at the same time, um, you know, it was important for us to, to have the the courage to take risks and evolve the, the gameplay feel so that it is fresh and different. So it's this, it's this, constant, uh, this constant kind of question of balance for us that we've wrestled with uh, since the beginning as a team. Ma how do we maintain both what is the core of Halo, making sure it feels like Halo, while at the same time uh, adding you know, new weapons, new abilities, new new uh, experiences that you've never had before uh, in a Halo game. And, uh, uh, but it, at its core, it does, it does feel very much like Halo, and it was really important to us um, to maintain that commitment to the sandbox nature of, of Halo gameplay, you know, making sure that we're empowering players to make choices in how they, they approach each problem instead of you know, giving them only one solution. Um, so that, that was, I think, one of the things that we really held uh, at the core of everything that we did. So I have a few other questions I wanted to ask before we get into uh, the other portions of the panel. And uh, we've talked a lot about Master Chief and uh, his importance to this new trilogy. Uh, in the trailer, the other character that showed up, of course, was Cortana. In fact, she's the first voice we hear. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the role she's going to have in this new game. So uh, Cortana definitely has an important role in this game. Um, this, is, this is John's story, but you know, when you look at the two characters who are uh, at the center of this universe and, and uh, their relationship and how important that's been um, to Halo over the, the first 10 years, um, it's something that, that we really wanted to explore as a team. And, and so she definitely uh, plays an important role in the game. I can say that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a certainly a unique relationship uh, with with Chief and Cortana that we actually haven't seen in other games, and uh, so certainly sort of continuing that and uh, maybe understanding that a little bit more was very important for us. So I actually want to go back to something that Josh said a little earlier uh, about finding the struggle, the balance between uh, wanting to evolve but stay true, and so that it is a Halo game. Um, do you ever find yourself uh, holding back on new ideas uh, because you're worried the community won't deem them Halo enough? I, I think that, that was what I was you know, trying to allude to in, in what I was saying is as a team, you know, we, we are all fans as well. And so it's one of those things that, that we uh, have struggled with since the beginning is just you know, how, much, how far can we push Halo while uh, remaining true. So yeah, definitely... We, we take into account um, the perspective of the community and the fans because that's so important to us. It's been the, the engine of, of uh, this universe's success over the last 10 years. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, that we will continue to wrestle with right up until the, the time that we release this game. And you, I mean, you just touched on something that I find unusual, which is that we've prototyped things in the studio that actually succeeded and were good and fun. And, and actually ended up removing them because they weren't, they weren't Halo, right? And that's really unusual. I mean, normally if you have a successful prototype as you're moving your game, like that's, that goes in. And, uh, and sometimes we've, we've done that and ended up taking it out because while it was awesome, it wasn't Halo awesome and it had to be something different. So Yeah, and I think the, the challenge that we face as well is that Halo has done so much and done it so well um, that we really have explored just a, a ton of different ideas as a team and having had the, the luxury of time to actually go through and, 
and try out all of these new things and, and find um, what we feel are, are the right bets to make and the right things to build around has been um, just an incredible experience. We've talked a lot about the, the story and the campaign. Uh, I don't think I could let you go without asking a little bit about the multiplayer. It's such a huge part of the Halo franchise. I'm curious, in Halo 4 in multiplayer, we're going to be catering to the uh, competitive or are we going to be catering to the casual player? I think you look at the, the Halo community, it's, it's such a diverse community. Um, there's so many different uh, perspectives that people bring to the experience. And it was really important to us as a team um, to try and represent all of those perspectives, all of those different play styles, and make sure that we're striking uh, the right balance between them and, and giving different players um, different experience depending on what they're looking for. I don't know if you want to build on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of that diversity in terms of uh, the types of, of Halo fans and players is actually reflected in the, in the team as well. So uh, I mentioned collaborative spirit earlier. I would say there's also a lot of like, good, healthy, heated debate on the team around all of these features. And, and you know, we have the very hardcore, and we have some of the broader audience. And I think that mix um, is really valuable in helping us sort of make decisions. Well, we're not quite done with the panel yet, but we wanted to go ahead and open it up to Q&A a little bit early. So if we can have folks line up, please be safe, <laughs> calm. You're not listening to a word I'm saying. It's cool. So we're going to alternate between right and left. We'll start with the right. Go ahead and ask your question. So what type of story will we see in Halo 4? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read off how the story goes, including the ending right now. No. Um, <laughs> The, uh, it's, I, I'll say this, it's, it's, uh, it is a direct continuation, in a way, of the events of Halo 3. I mean, Josh touched on that earlier. Uh, I'll clarify one thing from the interwebs, is that the 2554 year model would have shipped in actually the end of 2552, so that you're not getting any chronology clues from the, the new hog. Uh, but it will, it will deal with the, the fate of John and the fate of Cortana, and, and we sort of touched upon that. There's a lot of speculation about Cortana's mind state. Uh, there's a lot of relationship between those two characters, and characters are something that we're focusing on very strongly this time. But uh, also, to, to Kenneth's point earlier, there's, there's this world, there's this... I mean, Halo, to me, has always been about enigma and exploration and wonderment and scale, and I think that uh, you, you've already seen a little bit of Sparth's artwork, and it's, it gives this sense of incredible grandeur and scope and uh, t to me the story has that scope and that grandeur too and, and the luxury of having firstly having three years to think about the story and plan it and secondly to, to commit to a trilogy right from the start is, is a luxury that even Bungie didn't have with Halo 1 you know they didn't know if that was going to be a success they didn't know if the Xbox was going to be around and I think you go about planning your story arcs differently if you think you've got one shot uh, we know we have we know we have a loyal fan base and we know we have a community that's going to enjoy Halo games and so we're able to build a big epic story with lots of wonder and lots of explanation. Thanks. And real quick before we go to the next question, I got burned by this yesterday. For everyone asking questions, if you can just keep it to one question, uh, that way we're take, not taking advantage of those behind you. So. Thank you. Okay, um, my question is, well, the community has been fostered very well with Bungie, Overall, there's been one community that has been overlooked. That is the Halo modding community. My question to you, gentlemen and lady, is will 343 in the future with the Halo games foster this neglected community? Because there is a lot of talented people out there who haven't seen their, haven't, uh, the rest of the community hasn't seen what they have done, which is some of which is very impressive. So, your thoughts on that? I mean, can, I, can you clarify which part of the modding community mean? Because well, I think yeah, about CE yes. and... Okay, um, I'm talking about, well, actually, the modding community in general, because, well, CE is very impressive. Yeah. It's a 10-year-old engine. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't do tessellation or any of the nice lighting effects. Or, I mean, the less we've been able to do is some Halo 2 style effects, which is, of course, now outdated. So, yeah. Thoughts of the future. I, I mean, to, to be super honest to everyone in the audience, you know, Halo is primarily a console game at this point in its lifespan, and that's the, definitely the direction that we're headed. But 
we have had conversations internally about ways that we can open up existing products to the, the community and, and do more with that community. Uh, we can't commit to anything or promise anything, but I can, I can promise you that those conversations are happening all the way from the Waypoint backend team all the way to the, the front of the house, as it were. Thank you, gentlemen and lady. Hi, um, I just I know uh, Chief is traditionally a man of few words, but is he going to have more dialogue in this trilogy? Is he going to be able to talk? <laughs> I mean, just nonstop chatting. <laughs> he's gonna it's gonna be like the internal gonna, monologue. We're just gonna reverse Cortana's game. amount of dialogue with the Chief. So no. Yeah, I, I think you're you're definitely going to have an opportunity uh, to gain more insight into into John's mind in this uh, in this trilogy. Um, but it's important to strike the right balance. I mean, part of what I believe is so uh, powerful and magical about Chief is that he represents that marriage between the player and the character in in such a powerful way. And um, so finding the right balance where he can express himself without violating that kind of shared authorship of the experience that you get um, is really the challenge for us. And as you said, he is a man of few words, so um, he's not going to suddenly um, change in, in that regard. But, but we do want to give, uh, give him more opportunities to have his character come to the fore. Awesome. Thank you. And I mean, i just add one other thing. Also, you know, the Chief's, the chief's persona is defined by his circumstances and context and the people around him, but also his physicality, and that's definitely something that we're, we're exploring too, because the Chief is, I mean, if you hear a Spartan is coming, you should be filled with mortal dread and terror, especially if you're like an insurgent or a, a covenant, but, uh, but we, we just want to make sure that that aspect of his persona is really delivered on and, and that you, you enjoy that and feel that and play that. Yeah, that, that was one of the big commitments for us as a team was really, you know, understanding what it meant to be a Spartan, understanding what it would mean to be Master Chief and trying to explore all the ways that we can really immerse you in that experience and deliver that so that you have that sense of being this powerful warrior and and uh, and that it's a very kind of visceral and, 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 and tactile experience. And, you know, the, the truth is that uh, the only way that you can really understand that, I, I can use all the words in the world and it's not going to be able to convey, uh, you're going to have to play it and experience it. Um, so we're really excited uh, at some point in the future to be able to share that. But that has been a real uh, focus for us as a team. Frank talked a little bit about hearing Spartans coming. So we actually have a special guest who wants to come out on stage and uh, say hi to everyone. So uh, this says uh, this this armor in particular we're really excited about because it was actually made by you guys. It was made by the community. We worked with the 405th, uh, and we gave them uh, we gave them early access to some models and some some visual data to help them on their way. Normally they have to just sit down and copy it from screenshots and stuff. So, awesome. all right, Chief, uh, hop over here. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes, I was wondering if uh, there are any plans for a, an independent offshoot side story similar to ODST in the near future. You mean as a game? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we so uh, so there's definitely an offshoot side story in Halo Anniversary, and we're really excited about the terminal story in that. Yeah. Uh, when you, when you watch it as a sequence, it is a really big epic story uh, and delivered in a, a fairly novel way. But we we're heads down on Halo Four. Kiki can Kiki can attest to that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we're always sort of exploring what stories we want to tell over the next you know ten years and what's the appropriate medium. But yes, as Frank pointed out, all hands are on deck right now for Halo Four. Cool. Thank you. Uh, with the chief on his own, uh, without the Marines or the Covenant, from what the trailer says. Um, will there be factions that he's working with in this next game? Can you elaborate about any type of people that he'll be working with? 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, cannot for, elaborate. For, yeah, for us as a team, it's really important that uh, the fans experience the story and all of the surprises, uh, you know, at, at the appropriate time. And so we're, we're really, as much as we would love to share some of those details with you, um, we just have to hold back. So um, all will be revealed in time. Thank you. Nice try, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's obviously clear you guys aren't going to talk about story, but um, I'd like to know, if there's going to be a multiplayer beta for Halo 4, is it going to come with Anniversary? Uh, definitely, definitely not. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, a lot of people have asked us that, and we should, have, we should have just clarified that there will not be access to the Halo 4 beta with Anniversary disc. But if there's a Halo 4 beta, we will, of course, make it widely available uh, in, in a useful time frame. All right, thank you guys very much. All right, uh, since we're coming from Halo 3 as the previous chronological game, do we want to look at that sandbox for ideas of weapons and vehicles and stuff, or are we thinking the entire trilogy in general, or a uh, series in general, including ODST and Breach, for vehicles and weapons and stuff? I, I, I think... You know, you're going to see things in this game that are both familiar and new, and that's probably, uh, you know, and we, we look across, so to answer your question, I guess, more directly, we, we do look across the entire uh, trilogy of games as we look at the, the, the past sandbox that has existed. And, uh, and so you will see things that are familiar from, from past games, um, but also things that are, that are new. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I was uh, curious if you guys um, have uh, talked to the past voice actors from the uh, old Halo and if they're going to be returning and just a confirmation to see if Jen Taylor is Cortana because it was kind of iffy in the announcement trailer. So we're, we, uh, we, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that's story related and there's a bunch of stuff that's uh, audition related that we can't talk about right now. Uh, I wish I could go into more detail, but we are we, we continue to have a great relationship with all of those actors. Uh, Jen uh, was doing something with us very recently, uh, and we'll have more announcements about casting in the future, but there's really a bunch of spoilery story stuff that is one of the reasons we're not talking about it directly. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about co-op because in Halo 3 if you played as players 2 through 4 you weren't acknowledged and in Halo Reach it was kind of a step in the right direction but then when it went to cutscenes you know everyone was just one noble six uh, I mean what I will say <laughs> everybody looks at me um, yeah I, I, so I will say co-op um, is a is a big part of the Halo experience. It's something that we uh, think about throughout the the crafting of our campaign, and um, something that you know as our as our mission designers are building um, the the campaign experience. It's always top of mind, um, and that's probably all I'm going to say on that at this point. Word. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey guys, this is uh, 117 from the uh, Waypoint forums and Xbox Live. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you for Halo Fest. I think I can speak for the entire community when I say this was awesome. <laughs> and it was, it was really great to just come out here and celebrate all the years that we've had of this great game, and it's really great. Um, my question is, uh, the music that we saw in the Halo Fest trailer, or heard rather, uh, can we expect to see that again in Halo 4 possibly? Or was that an exclusive sort of thing? I, I can actually tackle that question. Uh, so the Halo Fest trailer was actually done by our, our friends at IGN. Okay. So the music was actually uh, provided by them as well. So uh, yeah. that was their music. It sounded great, but uh, uh, that was not done in-house. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, thanks guys. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I understand a lot of the information regarding Halo 4. You guys can't really spec, I mean, uh, you know, specify information or whatnot or talk about. But um, I had a question about the Forge feature. Um, I was just wondering if there was any new changes or ideas that may or may not come to fruition with the new Halo 4, like things such as like copy and paste, select all, snap to objects, things like that, or 
don't know if you guys can talk about it, but I figured I'd ask. <laughs> uh, I mean, Forge, I think, has been uh, an, an engine for the community to create and share amazing creations, and it's something that, uh, as, a, as a studio, we believe very, very strongly in. And so we are continuing to invest in developing um, that, that tool set, and, and uh, so definitely that's going to be something that is a, is a big part of what we do with Halo 4. Okay, thank you. Keep up the good work. So I understand that you can't really go into much detail, but you mentioned that there's more, you're going to be dealing more with active forerunner tech and stuff like that. So I was wondering if there'd be more like in new weapons, there'd be four, you'd be dealing with forerunner weapons or maybe even forerunner vehicles. I mean, and Josh obviously touched on this with the, the, the question before, but I, one thing I want to, I always like to bring up is that when you, you know, when you're building a sequel to a game, uh, you, you have to add things, right? You have to evolve things and you have to change things up. And you can just play and add weapons, uh, or you can, you, if you think about the DMR and the BR as kind of, one's effectively a replacement for the other, obviously. But one thing that's important about the Halo universe is it's a really big universe and you've seen a palette of things. So uh, as we think about things that we're adding to the game, we, we're looking not just to the past or investing in, in future stuff. We're just saying, what other stuff would the UNSC use? What other stuff do, does humanity have access to? And, uh, and, and a, a tricky particular for, for Halo 4 is it takes place post, post the discovery of Covenant technology, uh, sorry, Forerunner technology. So we, we've been being beaten back and beaten back and beaten back by the Covenant and haven't really had the time or the luxury to invest in research. Well, Karen Travis's novel Glasslands is going to touch on how the human race, when it's not being rocked back on its heels, is actually a fairly formidable force. And given time and given uh, the, the scientific curiosity that we have as a species, all of this stuff is going to be really interesting in terms of how we can advance our technology. And, uh, but the UNSC stuff uh, will still be gritty and warlike and very human. But there's lots more to come. Thank you. So I think we have time for about four more questions. So the first two in each line, um, you guys are good to go. Unfortunately, we have to cut it off after that. Uh, I just had a question. Uh, with the transition between Bungie and 343, uh, what's been the biggest challenge that you guys didn't predict or foresee? Well, we had to put in industrial strength toilets in the men's bathroom because the, the old ones were too weak for the action that we, we had for them. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually true. That is true. <laughs> so that was definitely the most challenging thing, certainly for my, uh, my boss is in the audience right now, and she's going to talk to me about that challenge after this, this panel. <laughs> they also chose to install those toilets right after lunch, which was great timing. Yeah. To be clear, the women's restroom was just fine. Oh, the women's restroom is a, a palace of delicate. sobriety and delicacy, yeah. Which is why I use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I can speak a little bit just from a, a sort of development standpoint. Uh, you know, we uh, built this team essentially from scratch, and so we brought in all this amazing talent. I think we probably have uh, 25 to 30 different game studios represented. And uh, you know, the, the hard part felt like it was going to be, let's make sure we can build a Halo together. And I think uh, given everyone's passion and understanding of Halo, that ended up being a, a smoother piece. I think the hard part was really taking all these people from different backgrounds and uh, who have different understandings of, of what feel like common terms, um, and bringing that group together and really making sure that um, we could always sort of move forward um, as one group. And you know, I think we, as we keep adding people, it's been a really rapid ramp. Um, but thankfully, you know, we have a, a very senior leadership team. Um, and so rather than it being too disruptive, we're actually able to gain the experience from all these different studios and all the different games that people have worked on and bring that. But uh, it, it does add a luxury that you don't have if you're building a franchise from scratch or, or even if you're in a team that's always worked on one game, which is that, you know, of the 200 or so people in the studio, 199 of them came to the studio because they wanted to work on Halo. Yeah. And that's, that's com probably completely unique, right? Is every single person there their destination was Halo rather than a job. Yep. Yep. 
And I, I would say, uh, I would take a different angle on your, on your original question, which is I think that part of the reason why the transition between um, Bungie and 343, the thing that's made it easier or smoother is that both studios, both companies uh, have look to the best way to take care of the community. That's something that Bungie's always done a, a fantastic job of. Uh, it's part of why Halo has been so successful is that they, they have cared so, so deeply about the community. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that really formed kind of a, a common ground for both 343 and Bungie is, you know, how do we make sure that this goes as smoothly as it can possibly go and that the community is well taken care of? Thanks. So you said that we're going to be exploring a little bit of John's character in the game. Uh, and I was wondering if that includes a little bit of his origin as a theme. You know, it's funny that, that most of the people in this audience know John's origin inside out. They know how old he was when he was kidnapped. They know what happened to his bones. Most people don't know that. You know, there's maybe 8 million Halo players out there who are completely unaware of his origin. And it's definitely something that we're sort of passionate about because it's formed him. And it's one of the things that separates him and differentiates him from uh, you know, all of the other military forces from Earth is he's a, in some ways alone and, and a very strange character. And he's obviously a hero to humanity, but he, he's, he's a fairly tragic figure in some ways. It's something we definitely like to explore in the future, but uh, I'm not committing to whether that's in Halo 4 or not. That's definitely something that we'll explore. I think any time you, you embark on a creative endeavor, you need sort of that point of fascination that brings everything together. And John and his backstory is truly fascinating. And that's something that um, we as a team have really, um, really loved to explore. And, uh, and it does inform uh, the work that we're doing on Halo 4 in a really deep way. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for uh bringing uh, in the backstory even in Halo Reach with uh, Dr. Catherine Halsey and that type. I was just curious about that element, seeing with Cortana and John and those relationships that exist. Uh, can we expect a little bit more exploration of, of that aspect of it uh, as we go forward with Halo 4? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thanks. <laughs> Hey, um, I was wondering if we're going to see the stories of characters like uh, Buck and the Arbiter be continued throughout the Halo series. Uh, so, yes. Uh, I think that very, very quickly you're going to see some stuff happening with ODSTs and Elites in Glasslands. Um, and as I said before, everything in there has a, a vital connection to the, the future Halo universe and to Halo 4. And to the, uh, you know, the, did we put that screen up already? The name of the trilogy? Yeah, the Reclaimer trilogy. Uh, so everything is going to feed into that. So there's a lot of clues about uh, human politics and the state of human covenant uh, relations in the aftermath of the war. Uh, and ODSTs and uh, obviously elites are going to be a big part of that. So th yes, there's going to be a bunch of stuff. I, I mean, the Arbiter is... is featured in Glassland somewhere, for example. So. Spoiler. Thank you. So I wanted to honestly thank everyone for coming today. This has actually been fantastic for us uh, to just see all the excitement, everyone who could come. I want to thank everyone for the, actually the excellent questions. Um, before we do wrap things up, uh, I believe Kiki has something she wanted to share with everyone. Yeah, I mean, first off, I have to say, um, I think on behalf of all of us, um, really how incredible the last couple of days has been um, in terms of not just celebrating 10 years of Halo, um, but for us also, uh, Frank gets this opportunity a lot, um, really in see seeing and meeting in person um, the fans. And that's been incredibly meaningful and incredibly um, inspirational for us. Um, I wanted to leave you um, with a little something that the team uh, really, really wanted to share with you some of the pre-vis pre work that they've been doing. Um, and uh, so we put together a little piece. It's not a fancy CG piece. Um, but it does showcase um, really some of the, uh, the amazing art of Kenneth's team, um, the concept team. And so it's some of the concept that we've developed um, 
really to define Halo 4. So we'll give you a little bit of a, a taste of that. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>